Chapter 9 They drove along Wilbraham Crescent, turned to the right up Albany Road, and then to the right again along the second instalment of Wilbraham Crescent. Simple, really, said Hardcastle. Once you know, said Colin. Sixty-one really backs on Mrs. Hemming's house, but a corner of it touches on nineteen, so that's good enough. It'll give you a chance to look at your Mr. Bland. No foreign help, by the way. Ah, so there goes a beautiful theory. The car drew up, and the two men got out. Well, well, said Colin, some front garden. It was indeed a model of suburban perfection in a small way. There were beds of geraniums with lobelia edging. There were large, fleshy-looking begonias, and there was a fine display of garden ornaments, frogs, toadstools, comic gnomes, and pixies. I'm sure Mr. Bland must be a nice, worthy man, said Colin, with a shudder. He couldn't have these terrible ideas if he wasn't. He added, as Hardcastle pushed the bell, "'Do you expect him to be in at this time of the morning?' "'I rang up,' explained Hardcastle, and asked him if it would be convenient. At that moment a smart little traveller van drew up and turned into the garage, which had obviously been a late addition to the house. Mr. Josiah Bland got out, slammed the door, and advanced towards them. He was a man of medium height, with a bald head and rather small blue eyes. He had a hearty manner. "'Inspector Hardcastle, come right in.' He led the way into the sitting-room. It evinced several proofs of prosperity. There were expensive and rather ornate lamps, an empire writing-desk, a coruscated ormolu set of mantelpiece ornaments, a marquetry cabinet, and a jardinier full of flowers in the window. The chairs were modern and richly upholstered. "'Sit down,' said Mr. Bland heartily. "'Smoke, or can't you, when you're on the job?' "'No, thanks,' said Hardcastle. "'Don't drink either, I suppose,' said Mr. Bland. "'Oh, well, better for both of us, I dare say. "'Now, what's it all about? "'This business at number 19, I suppose. "'The, uh, the corners of our gardens are joined, "'but we've not much real view of it "'except from the upper floor windows. "'Extraordinary business altogether, it seems to be, <laughs> "'at least from what I read in our local paper this morning. "'I was delighted when I got your message. "'Chance of getting some of the real dope. <laughs> "'You've no idea the rumours that are flying about. "'It's made my wife quite nervous, "'feeling there's a killer on the loose, you know. "'The trouble is, they let all these balmy people out of lunatic asylums nowadays, send them home on parole or whatever they call it, <laughs> then they do in somebody else and they clap them back again. And as I say, the rumours, I mean, what with our daily woman and the milk and paper boy, you'd be surprised. Uh, one says he was strangled with picture wire, the other says he was stabbed. <laughs> uh, somewhere else that he was coshed. Uh, at any rate, it, it, it was a he, wasn't it? I mean, uh, it wasn't the old girl who was done in. Uh, an unknown man, the papers said. Mr. Bland came to a full stop at last. Hardcastle smiled and said in a deprecating voice, "'Well, as to unknown, he had a card and an address in his pocket.' "'Oh, so much for that story, then,' said Bland. "'But you know what people are. I don't know who thinks up all these things.' "'While we're on the subject of the victim,' said Hardcastle, "'perhaps you'll have a look at this.' Once more he brought out the police photograph. "'So that's him, is it?' said Bland. "'He looks a perfectly ordinary chap, doesn't he? "'Ordinary as you and me. "'I suppose I mustn't ask if he had any particular reason to be murdered.' Oh, "'It's early days to talk about that,' said Hardcastle. "'What I want to know, Mr. Bland, is if you've ever seen this man before.' "'Bland shook his head. "'No, I'm sure I haven't. <laughs> "'I'm I'm, I'm, uh, I'm quite good at remembering faces. "'He hasn't called upon you for any particular purpose, selling insurance or... "'Vacuum cleaners, washing machines, or anything of that kind?' "'No, no, no, certainly not. "'We ought perhaps to ask your wife,' said Hardcastle. "'After all, if he called at the house, it's your wife he would see.' "'Yes, that's perfectly true. "'I, I, I don't know, though. Um, "'Valerie's not got very good health, you know. "'I wouldn't like to upset her. "'What I mean is, well, uh, uh, I, I suppose that's a picture of him when he's dead, isn't it?' "'Yes, said Hardcastle, that's quite true, but it's not a painful photograph in any way. "'No, no, no, very well done. The, uh, the chap might be asleep, really. "'Are you talking about me, Josiah?' "'An adjoining door from the other room was pushed open, and a middle-aged woman entered the room. "'She had, Hardcastle decided, been listening with close attention on the other side of the door. "'Oh, there you are, my dear,' said Bland. "'I thought you were having your morning nap. Uh, "'This is my wife, Detective Inspector Hardcastle.' A terrible murder, murmured Mrs. Bland. It really makes me shiver to think of it. She sat down on the sofa with a little gasping sigh. Uh, put your feet up, dear, said Bland. Mrs. Bland obeyed. She was a sandy-haired woman with a faint, whining voice. She looked anemic and had all the airs of an invalid who accepts her invalidism with a certain amount of enjoyment. 
For a moment or two, she reminded Inspector Hardcastle of somebody. He tried to think who it was, but failed. The faint, rather plaintive voice continued. My health isn't very good, Inspector Hardcastle, so my husband naturally tries to spare me any shocks or worry. I'm, I'm very sensitive. You, you were speaking about a photograph, I think, of the, of, of the murdered man. Oh, dear, how terrible that sounds. I, I don't know that I can bear to look. Dying to see it, really, thought Hardcastle to himself. With faint malice in his voice, he said, Perhaps I'd better not ask you to look at it, then, Mrs. Bland. I just thought you might be able to help us in case the man's called at this house at any time. Well, I, I must do my duty, mustn't I? said Mrs. Bland, with a sweet, brave smile. She held out her hand. Do you think you'd better upset yourself, Val? Don't be foolish, Josiah. Of course I must see. She looked at the photograph with much interest, and, or so the inspector thought, a certain amount of disappointment. He looks... really... He doesn't look dead at all, she said. Not at all as though he'd been murdered. Well, was he... He can't have been strangled. He was stabbed, said the inspector. Mrs. Bland closed her eyes and shivered. Oh, dear, she said. How terrible. You don't feel you've ever seen him, Mrs. Bland? No, said Mrs. Bland, with obvious reluctance. No, no, I'm afraid not. Was he the sort of man who... "'Who calls at houses selling things?' "'He seems to have been an insurance agent,' said the inspector carefully. "'Oh, I see. No, no, there's been nobody of that kind, I'm sure. "'You never remember my mentioning anything of that kind, do you, Josiah?' "'Can't say I do,' said Mr. Bland. "'Was he any relation to Miss Pebmarsh?' asked Mrs. Bland. "'No,' said the inspector. "'He was quite unknown to her.' "'Very peculiar,' said Mrs. Bland.' You know Miss Plebmarsh? Oh, yes, I mean, we know her as neighbours, of course. She asks my husband for advice sometimes about the garden. You are a very keen gardener, I gather, said the inspector. Not really, not really, said Bland, deprecatingly. Haven't the time, you know, of course. Now, I know what's what, but <laughs> I've got an excellent fellow comes twice a week. He sees the gardens kept well stocked and well tidied up. Yeah, I'd say you couldn't beat our garden right here, but uh, I'm not one of those real gardeners like my neighbour. "'Mrs. Ramsay?' said Hardcastle in some surprise. "'No, no, 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 farther along, 63, Mr. MacNaughton. "'He just lives for his garden, <laughs> in it all day long, and mad on compost. <laughs> "'Really, he's quite a bore on the subject of compost, but uh, uh, I don't suppose that's what you want to talk about.' "'Not exactly,' said the inspector. "'I only wondered if anyone, you or your wife, for instance, were out in your garden yesterday.' After all, as you say, it does touch on the border of nineteen, and there's just a chance that you might have seen something interesting yesterday, or heard something, perhaps? Midday, wasn't it, when the murder happened, I mean? The relevant times are between one o'clock and three o'clock. Land shook his head. Uh, I wouldn't have seen much then. I was here. So was Valerie, but uh, we'd be having lunch, you know, and our dining room looks out on the roadside. We shouldn't see anything that was going on in the garden. What time do you have your meal? One o'clock or thereabouts. Sometimes it's one thirty. And you didn't go out in the garden at all afterwards? Bland shook his head. Matter of fact, he said, my wife always goes up to rest after lunch, and if things aren't too busy, I take a bit of shut-eye myself in that chair there. <laughs> I must have left the house about, um, uh, I suppose, quarter to three, but uh, unfortunately I didn't go out in the garden at all. Oh, well, said Hardcastle with a sigh. We have to ask everyone. Oh, of course, of course. I wish I could be more helpful. <laughs> "'Nice place you have here,' said the inspector. "'No money spared, if I may say so?' Bland laughed jovially. "'Ah, oh, well, we, we like things that are nice. <laughs> Our wife's got a lot of taste. We, uh, we had a bit of a windfall a year ago. Our wife came into some money from an uncle of hers. She hadn't seen him for twenty-five years. Quite a surprise it was. <laughs> it made a bit of difference to us, I can tell you. We've been able to do ourselves well, and we're thinking of going on one of these cruises later in the year.' Very educational they are, I believe. Uh, Greece and all that. A lot of professors on them lecturing. Uh, well, of course, I'm a self-made man. I haven't had much time for that sort of thing. But I'd be interested. That chap who went and dug up Troy, uh, well, he was a grocer, I believe. Very romantic. I, I must say, I, I, I like going to foreign parts. Uh, not that I've done much of that. An occasional weekend in Gapery, that's all. <laughs> I've toyed with the idea of selling up here and going to live in Spain or Portugal, or even the West Indies. A lot of people are doing it. It saves income tax and all that. But uh, no, my wife, uh, she doesn't fancy the idea.
No, I'm, I'm fond of travel, but I, I wouldn't care to live out of England, said Mrs. Bland. We've got all our friends here, and my sister lives here, and everybody knows us. If, if we went abroad, we'd be strangers, and then we've got a very good doctor here. He really, he really understands my health. I shouldn't care at all for a foreign doctor. I wouldn't have any confidence in him. Well, we'll see, said Mr. Bland cheerfully. We'll go on a cruise. You may fall in love with the Greek island. <laughs> Mrs. Bland looked as though that were very unlikely. There'd be a proper English doctor aboard, I suppose, she said doubtfully. Oh, sure to be, said her husband. He accompanied Hardcastle and Colin to the front door, repeating once more how sorry he was that he couldn't help them. Well, said Hardcastle, what do you think of him? Well, I wouldn't care to let him build a house for me, said Colin. But a crooked little builder isn't what I'm after. I'm looking for a man who's dedicated. And as regards your murder case, you've got the wrong kind of murder. Now, if Bland was to feed his wife arsenic or push her into the Aegean in order to inherit her money and marry a slap-up blonde... Oh, we'll see about that when it happens, said Inspector Hardcastle. In the meantime, we've got to get on with this murder. <laughs>